So let's go ahead and jump into the third objection, if you're ready. Okay, now the third one is, and we hear this a lot from skeptics, and that's the idea that science has somehow disproved God. Um, we this, this is something that, gosh, there's so many debates about. There have been tons of books written. But the thing I think where I just like to bust it down to its bare bones is that by nature, first of all, if you, even if you ask what is science, people are going to give you a hundred different def definitions. Yeah, I was going to ask, are we talking about science or the science? Right, like because because we could be talking about like mathematical <laughs> the science. science, the science, yeah, because hashtag science, right? That's the right. reason everybody yeah. gives writing. But so if we're talking about the natural sciences, or you know, by definition, that's trying to find the causes of things. And so, uh, you know, I think that's probably the broadest definition of what science is. And so scientists, just by definition, what they're doing is they're studying the material world. Right. So they're, they're studying this one thing, but God is actually not made of matter. He's not material. So whatever they're studying, just by its very nature, is not going to be investigating the question of God. They're going to be studying the natural world. And so, and so what, what is so interesting about the way so many scientists go about saying that they've disproved God is they'll say something like I've heard I've heard this like all truth can be discovered by science or you know the only truth we can know comes from science but think about that statement all truth comes from science just take that statement that is a statement that is philosophical it's not scientific mm -hmm. You can't test yeah. that in a lab. So you have to have philosophical presuppositions basically undergirding how you're doing the science. And so uh, it, even for a scientist to say, God does not exist, that's not a statement of science. It's a philosophical statement that can't be proven in a lab. They can't test it. So in order for scientists to assert that God doesn't exist, they have to filter their findings through the lens of materialism, which, you know, I guess a, a broad definition of materialism is it's the philosophical belief that matter is the fundamental substance in nature, that all phenomena are a result of material interactions. And so it excludes just by nature the possibility of anything uh, supernatural. And there's a really interesting quote from uh, one of the world's leaders in evolutionary biology. This is a Harvard professor. His name's Richard Lewontin. And he actually admitted that scientists are committed to the philosophy of materialism. And so the reason I'm harping on this is because when they're studying the material world, every scientist, in order to analyze the evidence, they have to use philosophy. So, so this is why people like Frank Turek will say, science doesn't say anything, scientists do. You can have scientists that all have the same data, but they differ and disagree on what the conclusion is because they're analyzing and they have to use philosophy to do that. So you can't just, there's, there's not anything in the material world where you just look at it and everybody knows the conclusion, maybe mathematics or something like that. But here's what Richard Lewontin said. He said, and he's talking about scientists, he said, we take the side of science in spite of the patent of absurdity of some of its constructs. In spite of its failure to fulfill many of its extravagant promises of health and life, in spite of the tolerance of the scientific community for unsubstantiated just-so stories, because we have a prior commitment, a commitment okay. to materialism. And then he goes on to say that um, uh, they, 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 for them, materialism is absolute because they can't allow a divine foot in the door. They realize if they go outside of that materialism, they're making room for God. So in essence, they're not following the evidence everywhere it goes. In fact, Berkeley philosophy professor John Searle famously compared this to a religion. He said materialism is the religion of our time. Like more traditional religions, it's accepted without question and provides the framework within which other questions can be posed, addressed, and answered. And so I think it's so interesting to to realize that when scientists are studying the natural world, they definitely have a presupposition that they're coming to the science and they're analyzing it through that filter of materialism. But um, there's a great illustration from Frank Turek's book, Stealing from God. And, he's, and I think this will kind of bring this home for everybody. He says, to say that a scientist can disprove the existence of God is like saying a mechanic can disprove the existence of Henry Ford. 
it doesn't follow. A mechanic's job isn't to discover who made the car, it's to figure out how the car works. And so I think that's a really good analogy to help us kind of process. Uh, you have to take a philosophical leap to say that science has disproved God. Yeah, I completely, that was really, really great, Elisa. Thank you. I completely agree. And I, you know, so part of what we're talking at this point is, you know, in talking about creation, uh, we're talking about natural revelation. And so for our listeners, um, if you're not familiar with these terms, I think they're helpful categories. There's special revelation and natural revelation. Special revelation uh, would be, well, first and foremost, we, we have the Bible, both the Old and New Testament. Um, but but it's more than that. We have uh, prophecy. Uh, we have uh, visions, dreams, and I'm not saying that these things continue today. I would be in the cessationist camp, um, but that's where we got the Bible. <laughs> we got the Bible, the Old Testament from prophets and dreams and visions and the Lord speaking. Um, and so uh, all that would fall into the special revelation camp. So even prophecies that were not inscripturated, they were not written down like in the early church. Um, you know, Philip had four daughters and they prophesied. I, I don't we don't have a recording of any of those prophecies from Philip's four daughters, um, but we know that they did. And if it was true prophecy, which it's, that seems to be what the Bible says, then that was special revelation. So special revelation is is God's revelation through prophecy, through dreams, through visions, um, and of course, scripture. And the chief is actually not scripture. The chief of special revelation is Christ. Uh, Hebrews 1 says, um, long ago, God spoke to our fathers in many ways. And at many times, but in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. He is the exact imprint of the father's nature um, and the radiance of the glory of God. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. So Jesus is the final revelation and he is the pinnacle of special revelation. Natural revelation, however, we see multiple places in the scripture. I think Psalm 8 um, no, I think it's actually Psalm 16 uh, would be an example of, of um, David, the psalmist, saying that the skies proclaim, the skies are screaming and preaching um, the glory of God. And, and so we see all throughout the scripture, but perhaps the most memorable and iconic portion of scripture that speaks of natural revelation, how God, how God is revealing something about himself by what he has made would be Romans 1. So Romans 1, uh, starting verse 18, it says, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. So the truth is there, but they're suppressing it. Uh, Doug Wilson uses this illustration. He says, uh, unbelievers are like, uh, like people in a pool trying to hold a beach ball under the water. And our job as Christians is to poke their arms, maybe tickle them a little bit and say, what do you got there? What do you got there? Um, so for what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them for his invisible attributes, namely, now this is key, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So in these material things, there is something about God that can be seen. Um, and then it, it concludes verse 20 by saying, so that they are without an apologia, without um, an apologetic without an excuse, an argument. And so at the end of the day, um, it's important for us to recognize that the unbeliever, God forbid, if he does not save them and judgment has come and they're in hell, we should not think, oh, this poor person that, that just their, their, their greatest, their, their, primary problem was that they were ignorant. I think a lot of times Christians, because we want to be sympathetic, we want to be compassionate, which are all good godly traits. However, I think sometimes we're tempted to, to make excuses for the unbeliever. And we, and we think in a nutshell, I we, we do this. We say they're rebelling against God and, and certainly they're doing things that are sinful, but they're, re they're rebelling against God because they're ignorant of God. So we think that rebellion stems from ignorance, but what Romans one tells us is that ignorance stems from rebellion. So, so it's not first and foremost, a matter of the intellect. Um, it's first and foremost, a matter of the will because people rebel against God because they can't let the divine foot in the door. Like Elisa just said, uh, they, because they, every man does have an allegiance because we should say it like this, because neutrality is a myth. There is no neutrality. Um, math is like, well, math is neutral two plus two. Um, and all of a sudden, wouldn't you know it? We have people saying, well, maybe two plus two isn't four. M math is whiteness. M math is uh, white supremacy. It's oppressive, you know? And so um, even those things that we thought were new, and here's the thing, that all truth is God's truth. But what we're talking about is we're not just talking about the matter 
or the principle, but we're talking about people discerning, people interpreting, people observing th this matter. And, and those people have an allegiance. So the scientists have an allegiance. Um, so even when, 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 you know, COVID happened and all, I remember all the way back in March, I was really, 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 you know, like, whoa, let's slow down before we shut down, you know, the entire economy and every church in America and all, you know, and I remember arguing with my elders and back and forth. And I was like, okay, you know, they're like, Joel, don't, don't politicize everything. And I said, I, I don't want to politicize everything, but I think we're being, um, we're being naive if we don't recognize that everything is being politicized for us. Mm. So, so we don't need to politicize everything, but we're naive if we think that everything's not being politicized by someone. And we need to be discerning enough to say, okay, data doesn't have an allegiance, but where does data come from? Researchers collecting data, and then we have the media presenting data. So we have godless Yale and the godless New York Times working in concert and we say that there's, there's no moral agenda there. There's, there's no, that's, that's just, we, we must be innocent as doves, but we also need to be as cunning, as discerning as serpents. So Christians, we can't, we can, we need to be childlike, another sprawl thing, but we cannot be childish. We cannot be uh, foolish. And so uh, with this matter, what the last thing that I was going to say with Romans one is um, it says for his invisible attributes Namely, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly perceived. And, and that word perceived, it doesn't just mean that, that these attributes of God have been revealed. But, but what Romans 1 says is that all people, not just believers, but all people through natural revelation have perceived. So it's not just God manifested it, um, but, but the retina caught it. <laughs> it, it, it. It landed. It was perceived. It was seen by not just believers, but also unbelievers. But what was seen? Uh, every single aspect about the Trinity? No. Um, the gospel of Jesus Christ? No. Uh, you, you, you want the gospel? You need special revelation for that. Natural revelation is only sufficient for one thing, which is ultimately to condemn. What the, the, it, Paul says, namely, or, or that language means specifically, particularly what attributes of God? His eternal power and divine nature. Not his mercy. Not his son, Christ Jesus. Um, what's been seen is that there is a God. He exists. He is eternal. He is the creator. He is divine. He is powerful. And by way of implication, he is worthy of our worship. Um, that is all seen. But all of that is only sufficient. These attributes of God, that knowledge of the Holy One, all that is capable of doing at the end of the day is precisely what Romans 1 says. Stripping every man of any excuse taking away all. So it's only really sufficient to condemn us before a holy God. We need the special revelation of the gospel of Jesus Christ found in the scripture um, in order to ultimately uh, for redemption, for salvation. So all that being said, I, my, my point is just to say that um, as we look at creation, it does say something about God, but the problem is that every man has an allegiance. So we're not always willing to admit what it says. Mm -hmm. And then also, I think the other thing with natural revelation, part of the reason, this is my theory, but part of the reason I think that, that creation itself does not testify to more of God is because even creation. So not just the creature, humankind being fallen and therefore um, fallible in the way we, we observe and interpret matter, but also creation itself is under the curse. So there are certain things about the natural world. We have to remember nature reveals something about God. However, even nature is fallen. So there are certain things like death, for instance, that don't actually speak to who God is because no, that's not what he made. That's what we introduced into his creation by our sin. And so we have to, we have to say natural revelation is a real theological category. It is absolutely sufficient to condemn uh, every man, woman, and child apart from the grace uh, that is found only in Jesus Christ. Um, but we can't go too far with natural revelation. I think sometimes some guys will say, you know, from natural revelation, everybody knows, you know, uh, this doctrine and that doctrine. And so I, Paul says, namely, his divine nature and eternal power. Uh, it's a short list, but it says something. And um, yeah, so, right. It, it, that'd be tough. So, all right. Uh, any other thoughts that you would add, like to add to that? 
No, I, that was a very good breakdown. I Romans 1 is one of my um, favorite. Of course, I hate referring to any chapter of the Bible as a favorite over yeah, another yeah, one, but yeah. I just think it speaks so... Um, it, it, you, you mentioned hell and how people would be like, well, how could God you know, send people to hell because they've never heard the gospel? And, and you make such a good point. And I always go to Romans 1 with that too, because people don't... Well, I always like to ask people, first of all, put aside whatever you think hell is. Just you know, put that aside. Why would you want to be with God for all eternity under his rule and reign, submitted to his ways, mm -hmm. if you don't even like him now? Right. And I think, right. you know, we we look at Romans 1 and, and there, are, like you said, everybody has that that access to a certain degree of knowledge that God exists and even know things about him. And like you mentioned, people reject that. And that is and that is where, you know, it is sufficient to condemn in that sense. And so there really isn't anyone ever going to hell just out of pure ignorance because everybody right. has a chance to respond to that natural revelation. So I thought that was a really good breakdown. Thanks. Thanks so much. I hope you enjoyed this video. If so, would you consider supporting this ministry by giving a donation of any amount? You can do so by going to our website rightresponseministries.com. Let's be frank. Sadly, many evangelical pastors and leaders are serving as nothing more than water carriers for the political left. Just as those in the political left hate you, just like those corporations that are left-leaning hate you, these pastors and evangelical leaders hate you. I know that's a strong, a strong statement to make. I'm aware of that, but it's true. They don't care about your personal liberty. They don't care about your freedom. They want you to love your neighbor at the expense of biblical truth, even if it means bearing false witness. That's not us. We're different. We're not the only ones. I don't want to be arrogant. God has reserved a remnant for himself in this time as he has all other ages and all other places, but they are few and far between. It's called a remnant for a reason. We need your help. We want to stand up to tyranny. We want to stand up to this new left totalitarian regime. We want to defend Christians and people, the salt of the earth, who love America and who love God's word. But we can't do it without your help. If you're not prepared or able to give a financial gift, one way that you can support this ministry is by simply subscribing to our YouTube channel and clicking the bell so that you'll be notified as we come out with new content. You can also help us by sharing our content on all your social media platforms so that more people can hear the truth of God's word with courage and fidelity. Thanks for tuning in. God bless.